Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is my second time being out here in, in Breakspear, and I'm delighted to come and, uh, and be with you. Um, so um, let me say I will be talking in my talk about EHS and uh, probably not very much about MCS, but, uh, but I, you know, what, what I'm my, the main thrust of my talk is, is a general one about how electromagnetic fields impact the cells of our bodies and what the consequences of that, that impact are. And uh, so I, I want to say that, uh, and, and what I'm going to start out, I'm going to start out this talk in a way that's very different from what I've done before. I'm going to talk about some of the history of electromagnetic fields and human health and also the health of our, our um, mammalian brethren where it's been studied of course as well and uh, and and go from there so we're going to start out talking about some historical things okay so back in 1971 the US Office of Naval Research Na Naval Medical Research uh, issued a report listing various types of health effects uh, that are produced by uh, microwave frequency EMFs at non-thermal exposures. So these are very low exposures that don't produce substantial heating. Um, and uh, so these low intensity non-thermal exposures included over 100 different effects back in 1971. And those included 40 different things that could be called neuropsychiatric effects. Uh, these were changes in the brain structure and function, and also changes in other parts of the nervous system. Uh, again, structure and function. Changes in various kinds of psychological responses, changes in behavior. Forty different ones back in 1971. Eight different endocrine, that is hormonal changes, Cardiac changes influencing the electrical control of the heart. The heart has a pacemaker has has a um, an area in the heart called the sinoatrial node that contains the cells that act as a pacemaker in the heart. So we're not talking about an electronic pacemaker. We're talking about the real biological one. And um, and those cells, as I'm going to tell you later are particularly sensitive to these EMFs, and, and I'll tell you why. And, they, um, and their, their, their function is impacted. Uh, so you can get arrhythmias, you can get um, uh, various other changes, and I'll talk about some of them later. Um, again, these were known back in 1971. Chromosome breaks and other changes in chromosome structure, so the cells can be impacted, so the chromosomes uh, can break and, and rearrange. Um, histological changes in the testis. Um, these were all known, and there are a whole bunch of other things that were, were, had been reported as well. And uh, finally, um, cell death, what we now call apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, that those terms weren't used back in 1971, um, that occurs as well. And these are important processes that are involved in neurodegenerative diseases. So um, that's what was known in 1971. Now let me say, as you probably know, industry claims none of these things exist. Okay, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll talk about some of these further as we go on. Um, the uh, this report put out by the uh, U.S. Navy also listed. Um, something on the order of 2,000 citations. So, so there are 2,000 papers that they cited which provided evidence on these things, on these non-thermal effects. Okay, 1971. Amazing. Okay, so following that, there were dozens of reviews, including two others linked to the U.S. government, including uh, in, in, in all of these things reporting non-thermal effects. Okay and uh, thousands of additional primary literature citations, I think well over 10,000, 
Uh, I don't really have a good number for them because I haven't, you know, but, but it's, 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 it's a huge number. Um, and among these effects, again, uh, were documented uh, low, lower male fertility, including sperm quality and sperm function, uh, lowered female fertility. This is less studied. It's much harder to study female fertility than male fertility. Uh, and also uh, there are reports of um, higher levels of spontaneous abortion. So these are mostly in animal studies um, from, uh, from microwave frequency exposures. Um, so there's oxidative stress has been studied in, uh, in many, many, many different studies uh, shown to occur from these non-thermal exposures of uh, microwave frequency exposures. Uh, cellular DNA damage, and we talked about the chromosome damage. This is kind of how the chromosomes are damaged. Uh, you get uh, s both single-strand and double-strand breaks in the DNA of the cells, and you also get um, increases in a, um, in a, in a, in a, um, a potentially mutagenic uh, change. Uh, you get 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine, that's what that H-O-H-D-G is, uh, in the cellular DNA. Those have all been reported repeatedly. And uh, cancer. Um, cancer is likely to involve these DNA changes, and, but there's also recent evidence that there are um, increases in, uh, in tumor promotion or, or processes that are very similar to tumor promotion. Uh, in response to these uh, microwave and also uh, extremely low frequency EMFs. Um, and uh, the widespread neuropsychiatric effects, including depression. I have a paper that I, I uh, published recently on that. And uh, therapeutic effects. There are genuine therapeutic effects of these microwave frequency EMFs. And, uh, and uh, one, the one that's been most studied is the stimulation of bone growth, but there, there are quite a number of others. They occur under certain specific conditions with certain specific types of exposures. Um, and so we need to understand, obviously, how they occur as well. And cataract formation has been claimed to be due to heating. Uh, it's not, in fact, due to heating. Uh, we know that now. And, uh, and, and in fact, uh, I'll, t I'll talk to you a little bit about how cataracts are produced by these uh, microwave EMFs. Um, and uh, you, there's a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. So the brain becomes more exposed to t toxicants and to infectious agents. Um, and again, I think we know how that works. And there's uh, melatonin depletion and sleep disruption. So all of these things have been reported over and over and over again in the literature, and um, industry denies all this stuff. Um, now, despite all of the evidence for non-thermal effects, our current safety guidelines and standards are all based on the assumption that only thermal effects need be of concern. Um, so what we're... Uh, what we're, so, so there's a, a huge disconnect between our safety guidelines and standards and the science that has widely been published and accepted on the, in these areas. Uh, in 2015, this past year, uh, there was an appeal uh, sent to the United Nations and all of the member states that was signed by 206 scientists from 40 countries around the world. Every single one of these scientists were published uh, scientists in peer-reviewed journals who, who published papers in this area of biological effects of, uh, of uh, EMFs. And, and what, what was signed was um, a statement saying that the um, that the current safety guidelines and standards are inadequate because they don't take into consideration non-thermal effects. Okay. Um, anyway, the, this group of scientists collectively published uh, over 2,000 papers in this area. Um, 
I think there should be no question that there is an international scientific consensus about the inadequacy of our safety guidelines and standards and about the existence of a variety of non-thermal health impacts, okay? And so this obviously directly contradicts the position of industry and, and directly contradicts the claim that our current safety standards are just fine. Um, okay, so let's go on. Um, so how do these non-thermal effects work? What's the mechanism? That has been a big puzzle. There have been a number of mechanisms that have been proposed over the years, but none of them have been confirmed experimentally. And uh, basically what happened was that I stumbled onto the answer on this uh, about uh, three and a half years ago, published my first paper on it um, about two and a half years ago, and have published now um, four others, so a total of five papers. And there are going to be more in the future, I certainly hope, at least. Um, I've got one submitted now and, and working on an additional one, and several others need to be written. So um, all of these deal with the actual mechanism. Okay, so what is the mechanism? How are these things produced? Um, what I found was there were 26 different studies. And let me say, these are all studies in the literature. None of them are my um, experimental work um, that have shown that non-thermal effects of microwave and also lower frequency electromagnetic fields, EMFs, um, can be blocked by calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are drugs which are thought to be highly specific for blocking what are known <laughs> as voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay, which I've abbreviated VGCCs. You're going to hear that abbreviation quite a bit here. So, um, uh, so what what this tells you basically, and and well, let me let me uh, go on. Okay, so um, there are five different types of calcium channel blockers that have been used. They differ from one another in their chemical structure. They differ from one another in what site they bind to. On, 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 the, on these uh, VGCCs, um, and, and yet, and, and, and each of them is thought to be highly specific. So this is a very strong argument that, this is, that the, the VGCCs are the target, and when you, when you block them then using these calcium channel blockers, you block these biological effects. Now, most of these studies have been done in cell culture, but there are also some whole organism studies that have been done as well. Um, and, and let me just say, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, difficult areas here is that, you know, obviously people who are, who are highly sensitive think, well, maybe we can use these to lower the sensitivity. So far, that really hasn't paid off. I think there may still be some possibilities for using these as, as drugs, but uh, it's, not, it, it's, it's not clear at this point. So, um, now, okay, so, so what this shows is that EMFs act by activating the VGCCs, allowing calcium ions, and that's their, of course, calcium ions are Ca2+, to flow into the cell. And when you do that, so, so what you have, let me say I haven't, I haven't really explained this well, the, the VGCCs are channels in the plasma membrane, so they're in the outer membrane of the cell. And, uh, and so when they open up, they allow huge amounts of calcium to flow into the cell. It's the excess calcium in the cell that's responsible for most, if not all, of the biological effects. Okay, So, so we're looking at things that uh, work through this excessive calcium. And I think, and as you'll see, uh, as, when I talk further, that, there, that, that all of these uh, effects that we just talked about, these, these uh, health impacts, can be understood as being effects produced by this excessive calcium, uh, usually through, you know, through a sequence of events of what the calcium produces. Okay, so... Um, now, uh, one thing that's very important here is that in these 26 studies, 
it's not just microwave frequency EMFs whose effects are blocked. It's also the extremely low frequency EMFs that we get from our power wiring, 50 hertz or 60 hertz um, exposures, okay? Either, both from the wiring in, in buildings and also from high voltage power lines. Um, let me just say, I, I'm not saying, I, you know, I think the main concern now is the microwave exposures because, of course, the microwave exposure has been going up, you know, uh, every month, every year, almost every day. <laughs> uh, new devices being produced, uh, new exposures, new cell phone towers being put up, Wi-Fi being put all over the place, uh, smart meters, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, all these things. We're putting, we're putting um, uh, radar units on cars so they can drive themselves or at least park themselves etc right and all of this and and many other things are increasing our exposures so that's the main concern but there is also concern from the exposures from uh from from our power wires and that's uh something that we need to keep in mind as well okay so um now there are five additional types of evidence uh that support the vgcc mechanism I don't really have time to talk about each of them, but what I want to do now is talk about the most important of those because it produces, I think, a very important uh, observation which allows us to understand this at still a more, uh, a more uh, solid basic level. Um, so one of the great puzzles about this is that, you know, we've known uh, basically since the time of World War II that these EMFs can put forces on charged groups. So you have positive or negatively charged group in, in a chemical group in, in your cells or anywhere else for that matter. Um, these microwaves and also lower, lower frequency EMFs can put forces on them. And the way in which your micro, uh, the microwave oven heats your food and cooks your food is that it, it basically joggles charged groups in the food. So they go, go back and forth very rapidly. And that movement then heats up the food, and that's what cooks it, okay? That's been known, again, since about the time of World War II. Um, and, uh, but what, what industry has been claiming is that the, uh, the low-intensity EMFs, the ones that we're talking about all the time, are too low intensity to do anything. The only thing they do is heat things, and the low-intensity ones essentially produce zero heating because they just don't, you know, they don't have uh, enough power to heat things. Um, so they claim we shouldn't worry about them. And... Um, and they claim that because they claim that the forces placed on charge groups by these low-intensity EMFs are too weak to do anything. Okay, so keep that in mind, and we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna tell you why why in fact that's not true, but um, but it's important because it's an important argument, and it's an argument that. I think all of you will, will be faced with because this is the standard statement that's made. It's, it's, it's claimed that there cannot be a physical mechanism, there cannot be a biophysically viable mechanism for these low intensity fields because they're too weak. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, um, so, okay, I guess I've already said what's in this last paragraph, so I'll keep going here. The, uh, Okay, now this, uh, this slide, which uh, I'm going to uh, use my pointer on here. If you look at this, let me, well, can I take this out? Yeah, okay. Um, this slide, you can see, this is a, 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 um, a, a diagram of the VGCCs, okay? And like all diagrams, it's accurate in some ways and not in others, okay? Uh, it comes from a, a beautiful study that was published by 
Professor Annette, Annette Dolphin here in, in the UK. Um, and uh, what, what you can see here, it's not showing up quite as well. There's a membrane. This is the plasma membrane here. And these cylinders, there's a whole bunch of cylinders here, are what are called alpha helices where the alpha helix is going across the plasma membrane, okay? Now, if you look at this structure, what you'll see here is there are four structures that are very similar to each other, which are called domains. And this is found in the voltage-gated calcium channels, the BGCCs, and also in other voltage-gated ion channels. Um, so we have one domain, two, three, and four. And the fourth helix going over here from left to right is orange. And you can see that. And it has a bunch of plus, pluses on it, right? What are those? These are all positive charges. Okay? So you've got five here. You've got another five, another five, and another five. Those total of 20 charges on four alpha helices are what make up what is called the voltage sensor. Okay? So, these are all voltage, they're called voltage-gated channels. They respond to electrical effects across the plasma membrane. Okay? And when the electrical changes occur, they then can open up the channel and allow calcium to flow into the cell, okay? So the first thing is, this is the mechanism that responds to electrical things in the normal physiology. These, are, these, are, these have important physiological roles in our bodies. And, uh, and, and so that's the way they detect electrical changes. And so the thing I'm obviously going to suggest is this is the same way in which EMFs work, okay? And uh, they work on these things. Now, let me just say a couple of things about this. this these, uh, several of these helices, in fact, are, 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 actually, are, are actually angled. They're, 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 in, they're at, they're, they don't go straight, including this orange one, okay? So it's, it's not an accurate... Um, uh, model anymore because we've found out more things about it. But the other thing is that this thing is flat, right, in this diagram, but this it actually kind of folds around itself into kind of a cylinder. So basically, these, these four domains uh, kind of surround the center of it. And uh, when, when this guy gets pulled on because of his charges, it pulls out and uh, and it opens the channel in the middle. Okay, so that's that's the general way in which it works. Okay, now what I'm going to tell you now, if you compare the forces on this voltage sensor with singly charged groups that are elsewhere in the cell, and where are they? They are mostly in water in the aqueous phase of the cell. Okay. Almost all the charges are in the aqueous phase. These are not. These are in the membrane away from water. That's important. Why is that important? Well, for one reason, because uh, there was something called Coulomb's law, which was uh, a, a law in physics that was developed back around the 1780s. Uh, and, uh, and, and in Coulomb's law, Part of Coulomb's law said that the forces on charged groups, like these guys, is inversely proportional to the dielectric constant of the medium they're in. Okay? It turns out that the dielectric constant of this, of this lipid bilayer, or the membrane, is about 1 120th the dielectric constant in the water. So you have water here, you've got water there, and then you've got these guys in the middle. And so what that means is the forces on these charged groups are about 120 times higher than you think based on that, based on the dielectric constant, okay? And in addition to that, the plasma membrane is a very, has a very high electrical resistance. 
And so what happens is when you have an electrical um, force coming in here, it tends to concentrate right across the plasma membrane because of that high electrical resistance. This is only about four nanometers across here. So it turns, and the estimate has been made as to how big the concentration is, and it's about 3,000 fold. Okay? So, the, so what that means is, and uh, let's go on here. Um, what that means is that the force on the voltage sensor is about, and I want to say the, these are rough calculations, okay? I'm not saying that they're written in concrete, but they give you some idea what we're talking about. The forces on the voltage sensor compared with singly charged groups elsewhere in the cell is 20 times greater, the 20 being the number of charges, times 120, that being the dielectric constant effect, times 3,000, that being the effect of the, um, uh, because, because of the plasma membrane electrical resistance. And you multiply those together, and of course your, 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 your school math will tell you it's 7.2 million, okay? Now, what that means is roughly speaking, the force on the voltage sensor is about 7.2 million times stronger than the force on singly charged groups elsewhere in the cell, okay? Um, and what that means is that all the claims of industry and the industry supporters that these forces aren't strong enough are off by a factor of about 7.2 million, okay? Now, um, okay, now l let me just say another thing here about, I mean, there are a lot of variables that will influence that number, okay? There are other things that are going to influence that number, both either up or down. Okay, could be much higher, could be lower. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, don't, don't take that number as a hard number, but what it is, it's a number that gives you an estimate of the order of magnitude to which these claims of industry are off, okay? Uh, the other thing is, because heating is produced by forces on these other charged groups, um, the, the, and, and, and these forces are, as I say, about 7.2 million times stronger. And the, and, the, and the safety guidelines and standards are based on heating. It argues that the safety guidelines and standards are off by something like 7.2 million. In other words, we're being exposed to levels that are 7.2 million times too high uh, because they're using the wrong target. Okay? Um, now, um, now that obviously produces a huge change in our outlook on this thing and our understanding of it. And that's, uh, you know, if, if there's any single thing that should be, um, you know, an uh, important sort of take-home lesson, um, this should be it, I think. Now, uh, okay, so when we look at... Now, so how does it work? Okay, so we have microwave and lower frequency EMFs, and they can um, activate these VGCCs. Uh, and and uh, so for the um, um, and if you and 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 then another thing that happens, so you then get increases in intracellular calcium, and intracellular calcium is usually designated with this Ca two plus I. That's, so that's the calcium concentration in the, uh, in, in the cytoplasm of the cell. And one of the things that happens that's very important is that you get a big increase in nitric oxide, NO. Why is that? Because there are two enzymes that make nitric oxide, what are called nitric oxide synthases, that are calcium-dependent enzymes. So they're essentially completely inactive. Uh, under normal circumstances where there's very low calcium in the cell. But when you have lots of calcium in the cell, you can get a huge amount of nitric oxide, okay? Um, let me just say one of the very important experiments that was done, uh, and, and it was published by uh, uh, Professor uh, Arthur Pilla, um, he showed in cell culture that you could take some cells and... Uh, uh, expose them to uh, a pulsed microwave frequency field and 
uh, in less than five seconds you could, you could measure a huge increase in nitric oxide. Uh, so this whole thing occurs extremely rapidly, okay? And uh, now nitric oxide, NO, uh, acts along a nitric oxide signaling pathway, involves cyclic GMP and the, and, and, and the G kinase, also known as protein kinase G, uh, and that will then modify a number of proteins. These produce therapeutic effects, okay? And I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to to document that, but both Pill, Pill has made an argument on that, and I have as well, uh, that this is the mechanism therapeutic effect. So there are real therapeutic effects, as I said, and I think we understand how they work, um, at least at this level. Okay. Now there are other things that are going on here. You get not only increases in nitric oxide, but you also get increases in in superoxide. Um, through, through the role of, of this um, excess intracellular calcium. These two react with each other very rapidly to form peroxynitrite, this ONOO minus. Uh, that's the chemical structure, ONOO minus. And uh, peroxynitrite is a potent oxidant, and it breaks down to form free radicals and oxidate, produce oxidative stress. And all of these things, I think, have important roles in many of the pathophysiological changes that occur, so the disease-causing changes that can occur. Um, in addition to that, um, other kinds of calcium signaling are very important, and you can see that over here if you look at the arrow that comes down from Ca2 plus I. Those are other kinds of pathophysiological effects. Uh, produced through excessive calcium signaling. Okay? So calcium signaling is very important in the cell, and you got way too much of it, you've got problems. And that's basically what I'm saying is that this can be a big issue here. Um, and so what I'm going to say basically is that, um, is that the pathophysiology can be generated mainly through these mechanisms. Therapy, of course, through that mechanism over there. Okay, okay. So um, now let me see how we're doing. Okay, I think I better. Okay, so okay. Um, what I want to do, you know, I've talked about these thousands and thousands of studies that have shown all kinds of effects, and I just want to talk about one of them specifically because I think it's it's so important and indicative of what's going on. Um, this was a study that was, um, that was published by Lutz and Adelkoffer in Germany. Um, and, uh, and it involved something called a comet assay, which I suspect most of you don't know anything about. Um, this is a way of measuring the production of single-strand breaks in DNA. Okay. Um, so you have cells that are being exposed here to uh, EMFs, and in, 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 uh, uh, this is an EMF that's at least somewhat similar to what you get from, from a, a cell phone or mobile phone, and I'll tell you about one of the things that's different about it. And you also have um, another interesting exposure, which is to gamma irradiation, the equivalent of 1,600 chest X-rays. Okay, so big exposure here, um, and uh, this is the equivalent of 24 hours of cell phone, but actually it's, it's, it's not quite the equivalent, and I'll tell you why in a, in a little bit. Um, now, what you do here is you, 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 do, you do whatever you're going to do to, you know, to the cells, and then you put them in alkali, you know, sort of like... Uh, sort of lie, like lye that you might use. Um, I'm not sure what people use lye for anymore. Um, you know, highly, highly alkaline. And what that does is it, is it separates out the strands of the DNA. And if you, have single, if you have a lot of single strand breaks in the DNA, the single strands can kind of get out from this mess and you, you put them in an electrical field and they'll move uh, towards the negatively charged, uh, sorry, towards the positively charged pole because they're, they're negatively charged, right? The DNA has a lot of phosphates on the, on the, on the backbone of it, okay? So, um, 
they'll move out. But if you have big pieces of DNA, they stay there because they're too big. They can't get out. You know, they, they get trapped. Okay. So basically, this is only the small ones that move. And, and so what you see here, here you have nothing. It's a sham, it's a sham control. There's no exposure. You don't see anything, right? With these things, you see this tail going out towards the electrode. And, uh, and let me just say, the way in which you visualize the DNA is you use a dye that binds the DNA and fluoresces, okay? Only when it binds the DNA does it fluoresce. So that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the fluorescent color, okay? So um, what does this tell you? It tells you, first of all, that the exposure to, you know, a very low uh, exposure level of these uh, radio frequency or microwave frequency EMFs can produce lots and lots and lots of single strand breaks in DNA, comparable with what you get with a very high powerful X-ray machine giving 1,600 X-rays, okay? Um, so uh, let me say industry says none of this should happen. In fact, this thing's been reported now by at least two dozen different research groups. Uh, and uh, Henry Lai at the University of Washington was the first one to do this. And for his efforts, he got attacked by industry, who tried to get him fired. And um, he, they were unsuccessful at that. They also tried to have his, his research funding uh, taken away, and they were successful with that. So um, that's the world we live in. Okay. So uh, now I want to say uh, one other thing about this before we leave, and that is these, this study was done with a continuous wave exposure. It's known now that pulsed waves are much more biologically active in most cases than continuous wave. Uh, and uh, mobile or cell phones produce a pulsed wave exp exposure, okay? When you actually look at real, at real mobile phones as opposed to these continuous waves, it was found uh, that, that, in fact, there is much more DNA damage done with a real cell phone than with, with this, okay? So this is misleading in the sense that, um, okay, and that difference actually was also shown in a study that Adelkoffer published later with several colleagues that's, uh, I have the title of it here, I don't have the citation, but you can, you, you can find it fairly easily um, in, uh, in, in PubMed. Uh, so, so basically what we know is that, in fact, this understates the actual activity of real cell phones, which is much higher than this. Okay? So what we have is we have cell phones which, you know, have a tiny little battery producing a very low field, and um, producing lots and lots of single strand breaks in the DNA, uh, compared with 1,600 chest X-rays using a very high power X-ray machine. And, uh, and so, so the question is why, how, how is it possible that we're gonna get all of this stuff with this very low intensity uh, exposure? Um, you know, I mean, it, it's really quite stunning. And the question is, you know, what's, what's, uh, how do you explain this? And my explanation, which I'm not sure is correct, but I suspect is correct, is the following. When you, you look at these things, what you find is there are several levels. So it's the free radicals that produce the DNA strand breaks, okay? They attack the DNA, and that's true both with the ionizing radiation and with the, um, with, with, with these, uh, with the VGCC activation. Um, in the VGCC activation, you have three levels of amplification that occur. So when you open up these VGCCs, they let, uh, they let in about a million calcium ions per second that they're open, okay? So there's huge amplification from this opening mechanism into increased calcium in the cell. Um, in, and then you get both nitric oxide and superoxide increasing uh, as a consequence of that, and that's basically sort of a catalytic mechanism. Once the calcium is high, it can keep producing these things for a long time, okay? So you have an amplification in production of, of nitric oxide and superoxide. And then finally, 
These two react with each other, and the rate of the reaction is the product of the two concentrations So to form peroxynitrite. So there's another level of amplification there. So there's three levels of amplification in this process leading to the production of free radicals. Okay. Now, how does that compare with ionizing radiation? Ionizing radiation, there is amplification, but it's only one level. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and how does that work? Well, it was um, Arthur H. Compton uh, has, uh, was, got the Nobel Prize in 1927 for discovering what became known as Compton scattering. And uh, I think he was, a, he was a Brit, wasn't he? Does anybody know? <laughs> I think he was. Um, and... Uh, what, um, anyway, he, he, you know, basically what, what he, he showed was that these, these very high energy, so, so these very high energy uh, the ionizing radiation, um, the, the, the photons individually have a lot of energy. When they go through um, a, a region of the cell or any, almost anything else, uh, what do they do? They start knocking electrons out of uh, out of molecules, and uh, when you knock an electron out of molecule, another molecule picks it up, and what do you get? You get two free radicals for every electron that gets knocked out, and you get a whole chain of these free radicals produced from these uh, these uh, these um, individual photons from the ionizing radiation. So there is an there is a level of amplification there, but it's only one. And whereas we've got three, three levels of amplification here. Now, that doesn't prove that this is going to be much more active. But when you see a study like this, I think it provides a, 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 a cogent explanation as to how you can get these things from a low-intensity field. Um, and so these fields may, in fact, be even more dangerous than ionizing radiation. I think that's... That's another important take-home lesson here. And that's basically what this study shows us, okay? Now, um, okay, um, I'm going to go through these probably in about three minutes. Um, there's a table here which, which shows you various kinds of changes, and I've talked about all these changes very briefly. Oxidative stress, single-strand breaks in DNA, double-strand breaks in DNA, 8-hydroxyguanosine uh, and deoxyguanosine in, 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 in DNA. And all of these, and, and then cancer, all of these can occur through known mechanisms as downstream effects of the excessive intracellular calcium. And I don't have time really to go through them individually, but what I'm saying is there are plausible mechanisms for all of these things, and many other things. Uh, breakdown of blood-brain barrier, male and female infertility, therapeutic effects we talked about already, uh, this depression and widespread neuropsychiatric effects, melatonin depletion and sleep disruption. I don't know, did I talk about that? Can't remember. Um, cataract formation, uh, the cardiac effects. Tachycardia, you can get rapid heartbeat, you can get bradycardia, slow heartbeat, you can get arrhythmias. Arrhythmias are often associated with sudden cardiac death. Uh, you also get heart palpitations. Um, these things, I think, all go through the uh, pacemaker cells that I mentioned earlier, which have a very high density of these VGCCs in them. Okay, that's known. And uh, so... Um, there are a number of hormone effects that can occur, um, and, uh, and, uh, and the steroid hormones, which unlike the others, are not released through the action of the VGCCs and intracellular calcium, uh, but the uh, synthesis of the steroid hormones can be impacted by, by excessive nitric oxide, okay, and that and can be lowered. Um, apoptosis uh, program cell death can be produced by calcium and also um, it can, at least under some conditions, 
be produced by this 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine that we talked about before. So all these things are plausible mechanisms by which they can be produced. And in some cases, we've got substantial evidence supporting them, in other cases not. The one thing that I would say, though, as a general thing, is that um, industry will claim that there cannot be a mechanism for these things. And what this shows is they're wrong about that. There, are, there can be. These are all plausible mechanisms. So anytime they claim that there cannot be a mechanism, um, you know, the, these things clearly show that, that that's not true. And I think that's a, that's a crucial, crucial thing. Now, um, okay, so basically all those things can be explained through this, through this, um, this mechanism of action. Uh, involving the VGCC activation and uh, excessive intracellular calcium producing all these other things, okay? Okay, now, um, now these are not the only things that are going on, but these are um, among the best uh, described and, and the best understood in terms of mechanism. And they give you some idea of the breadth of the effects here. And I think you can see that these documented effects of microwave frequency EMFs attack each of the four things that we most value as individuals and as a species. They attack our health in various ways. They attack our brain function. There are massive effects on the brain of these uh, um, of, of, of non-thermal exposures to microwave radiation. Um, in, in animal studies that go back, some of them go back all the way to the 1950s. Um, they attack the integrity of our genomes, they attack our DNA, and they attack our ability to produce healthy offspring. All of those things are being attacked by these EMFs. And uh, so we're, we're in, in very deep trouble. Now, um, Okay, um, I, I know uh, a number of you are interested in electromagnetic hypersensitivity, EHS. Um, and uh, so, cases of EHS are thought to be caused by previous exposures to EMFs, particularly microwave and radio frequency exposures, but not only. Um, and I think one of the main sources of information about EHS is the other related disease, uh, MCS, um, which uh, has many similarities to EHS. Um, and so specifically, um, cases of each of them are thought to be initiated by previous exposures, most commonly chemicals in the case of MCS and EMFs in the case of EHS. Um, such exposures can then cause high-level sensitivity responses. Um, MCS and EHS are often comorbid, that is, they often occur in the same individuals. Um, both involve symptoms coming from the brain and symptoms coming from peripheral tissues, okay? And so, um, so there are different tissues that are involved. And... There's a lot of variation in the symptoms from one individual to another. They're not all the same. Uh, they're not all the same in terms of severity, but they're also not all the same in terms of which tissues seem to be impacted. Um, so this is consistent with a primarily local mechanism with variable tissue distribution. And I'll talk about some of that just a little bit, but not much. Um, but that's... Uh, uh, let me say, I don't think it's surprising that, that you have this variation, and I think there are good reasons for it. And uh, um, Now, with MCS, if you look at these um, seven classes of chemicals which are implicated in causing MCS, um, all of them, do you have that? Yep. Um, all of them go work along different pathways, so they all work uh, along different different. Uh, roots of action, but they all end up giving us excessive activity of the NMDA receptors, okay? And we know that that activity is, that excessive activity is important because with each of these classes of chemicals, 
it's possible in animal studies to show that using an NMDA antagonist, that is using a drug that lowers the activity of the NMDA receptors, can lower the toxicity of these chemicals, okay? So the toxic action of these chemicals um, uh, goes through, to a considerable extent, excessive NMDA activity. Um, and um, so that's basically, and, and uh, now what, ha what happens when you activate the NMDA receptors? is very, very similar to what happens when you activate the VGCCs, okay? And um, so both of them, when they're activated, open up an ion channel. That channel, at least with the L-type VGCCs and the NMDA receptors, they stay open a relatively long time period. There's, you know, some channels open up and they close up in a millisecond or so. These things stay open much longer than that. Um, they can allow substantial amounts of calcium to flow into the cell. Uh, they, the, the effects that they create are uh, generated um, through excessive calcium uh, almost exclusively. And um, they lead to the production of large amounts of nitric oxide and often to large amounts of peroxynitrite um, for both. And both have been shown to be able to stimulate what's called long-term potentiation. That's a mechanism which is thought to be involved in learning and memory in the brain, which causes the synapses in the brain to be much more active in transducing, you know, and basically stimulating one neuron through the action of another. Okay, so this has been called neural sensitization. And, uh, and so... Um, you know, I mean, so so one of the one of the take home lessons I think that you, that 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 you should you should take is that neurosensitization is almost certainly involved in both MCS and in EHS, and uh, and so all those things um, kind of make sense in terms of what we now know about the biochemistry of both the chemicals and uh, the effects of uh, with and and the VGCC uh, response in the case of EMFs. Okay, so, um, so what we have here then are a lot of similar properties between the two, and I don't think it's coincidental. And let me just say, excessive calcium in the cell not only has roles in, in, in this kind of sensitization, but they're also classic chemical sensitizers, such as um, the one that's been most studied is toluene diisothiocyanate uh, is a classic chemical sensitizer, and it also works through excessive calcium. Okay, so uh, I don't think there's any, any um, you know, I mean, I don't think it's coincidental that excessive calcium has a, has a really important role in all of these things. So, um, now, um, there are two other types of observations that suggest to me that EHS is a real sensitivity condition. Uh, one is that EHS people on exposure often develop very much the same neuropsychiatric symptoms uh, that are caused by, by EMF exposure in the general population. It's just at lower intensities that you're seeing it. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that the cardiac symptoms that are produced in some EHS people, not in all, uh, are again very similar to what you see in the cardiac symptoms uh, in the general population. Okay, so um, so so that suggests you know that the 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 responses are similar, but um, EHS people are are more sensitive uh, than normal people in in these responses. Okay, now. Um, I'd like to say, okay, so, so I, I, I've been corresponding over email with uh, Dr. Cornelia waldman Selsam, who's been tell, who sent me a, a draft of a paper, and, and I looked at this and I said, oh, this is really fascinating, and I asked for her per permission to talk about it, and she's given me permission to talk about it, okay? So this has not been published. I think it's really extremely exciting, and it's a case study. It's an individual case study of a woman with EHS who also had damage 
to her parathyroid. Okay, so she had an accident which damaged the parathyroid. Parathyroid, is, as you may or may not know, has an important role in controlling the levels, of the circulating levels of calcium. Okay, so calcium outside the cell, calcium in the blood, is regulated by parathyroid hormone. Okay, so because she doesn't produce any parathyroid hormone, she is unable to control her extra, the extracellular calcium in the normal way that that everybody else is. Okay, and uh, so they basically have to keep her on calcium supplements in order to keep the calcium levels normal um, in the in the blood. But what's interesting is she has this extraordinary uh, sensitivity and when she's exposed to extremely low levels, what happens is the calcium levels in her blood undergo a, 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 a huge decline, okay? And she suffers from, from the physiological consequences of that, of course. So where is the calcium going? Well, I think the obvious that place is the calcium outside the cell is going inside the cell. Some of it be, may be going into the kidney cells and getting excreted, but whatever it is, um, it, it, what this argues is that EHS not only is caused by um, excessive sensitivity to uh, intracellular calcium, but it also that the VGCCs themselves are highly sensitive, okay, in EHS people, okay? So otherwise you can't explain this, 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 this study. So I think this is a really interesting study. And uh, let's see, I guess I'm running out of time. Um, let me see. Can I take about five minutes and, okay. Um, so... All right, so let me just say, you know, I, I mean, obviously, the you know, the, the outline that I've given you is something that looks pretty horrible, um, I mean, worse than pretty horrible. Um, one of the things I've been starting to do is starting to talk about what I call worst-case scenarios, things that make this whole thing look even worse than what I've just been describing, okay? So... Um, um, and, 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 and one of the things has to do with the autism epidemic, okay? Um, there is an argument, and I don't have really time to talk about it, basically, that, uh, that the EMF exposures are the main driver of the autism epidemic, not the only driver. I think chemicals also have a role uh, through uh, excessive calcium in much the way, same way that we just talked about. But, um, but basically... Uh, if you look at this slide here, that the microwave and lower frequency EMFs act through VGCC activation to produce excessive calcium in the cell, and that in turn uh, acts in actually five different ways. I only have four of them on this slide um, to uh, disrupt both the formation and the function of synapses in the brain. Okay. And these four processes, and as I said, there's a fifth that I haven't put in here, are all calcium dependent. They're all regulated by calcium. If you have too much calcium, too little calcium, inappropriate levels of calcium, it will mess up the formation uh, and the function of the synapses in the brain. And that's almost certainly the crucial issue that, that impacts the autism patients, and that's there's there, there's quite a bit of evidence that that's true, and we don't have time to talk about it. But basically, I think that the um, microwave lower frequency EMFs are the main driver of this. The chemicals also have roles. Uh, I could be wrong about the microwaves being the main driver, but I don't think so. I think this is probably the way the the main way in which it works. Okay, that's uh, and let me just say there are ten research groups that have proposed. Uh, that, 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 that this is, that the, that microwaves are, are causing the, um, uh, the, the, um, the autism epidemic, but they didn't really have a mechanism of this sort. And so I think this may be a, a substantial breakthrough here in our understanding of it. Um, okay. So number two, neuropsychiatric effects. Um, 
I published a paper last year, and these are all neuropsychiatric effects that are, have been widely uh, reported to occur in response to many different kinds of, e of microwave frequency EMFs, okay? Lots of different types of fields uh, do this, okay? Not just one or two or three. Um, and uh, so these are, these are things that have been, you know, repeatedly found. Some of the, some of the studies go way back as I've already said, you know, the, the, uh, there was some in the, uh, in, in the uh, 1971 review from, from the uh, Naval Medical Research, uh, but there are others that have gone on for years in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, all the way up to the present. Uh, now, recently, there have been a lot of studies of people who, uh, who, uh, been ex who live near cell phone towers, uh, there are studies of people who have heavy cell phone use, and there are studies of people uh, who have been impacted by smart meters uh, producing uh, many of these kinds of changes. Okay, so this is a big um, this is a big problem that's going on. This is extremely well documented now, and we know there are massive impacts on the brain of animals of these fields. Okay, at levels well within safety standards. So, um, you know, there's, there's absolutely massive effects on the brain. So, worst case scenario number three, um, sterility, spontaneous abortion, uh, what happens when reproduction goes to zero? Or what happens even if it goes down to, you know, um, say 25% of what we have now? Or twenty or ten percent of what we have now. What happens? Um, is this is this just fiction, or is there some reason to think this may may in fact be happening? Uh, there was a fascinating study published by uh, Magras and Zenos back in 1997, so almost uh, 19 years ago. Has never been repeated. Okay, um, it's a scandal. It's never been repeated. They showed that they took pairs of mice, and they, they put them together, so they were, you know, one male and one female in a little cage, um, down at ground level in an antenna park. So here's a bunch of broadcasting antennas, and the levels at ground level, you know, when you measure them, you say, well, okay, they're well within our safety standards, you don't have to worry about them, right? What happens is that these, um, these become completely sterile. Uh, it takes about it took about two and a half months um, for the ones that were in the higher level exposure location and about four and a half months for the ones that were in a lower level, all within safety standards, all right? They become completely sterile, period. Um, okay, let's talk about other things. And I... Um, you know, we know there's DNA damage. We talked about that. Um, we know that these, that these fields have a big impact on the reproductive system. I just told you about that. Um, the question being raised here, are there lots of germline mutations? Okay. Um, there are only three studies that I know of on this. They were all done uh, with males, I think in rats, and they all reported mutational increases in the germline, okay? So we are probably accumulating more and more germline mutations, which of course will be passed on to future generations. It's been calculated that in humans, if we have a level of mutation that's two and a half to three times what it is normally, this is before we started exposing ourselves to microwaves, we will become extinct. Why? Because we'll just generate more and more damaging mutations, and eventually, you know, essentially all the progeny will, or, you know, will be so defective that that'll be a huge problem. Um, okay, so we may be destroying ourselves in that way. And uh, finally, the fifth worst case scenario is uh, unexplained epidemic of, uh, of premature onset dementias. Um, we know that there are effects, and by the way, I have, there, there's a recent study on this that I don't have in this slide, but um, 
you know, there, there are a number of studies that have shown that this uh, seemed to be going up very rapidly. Uh, these very early, and particularly, I mean, people age 30 coming down with dementias, uh, unheard of in previous times. Now they're still rare, but they are occurring. Um, the, uh, we know that high levels of intracellular calcium have an important role, not only in Alzheimer's disease, but in all of the neurodegenerative diseases, okay? Um, and we also know that from epidemiological studies, uh, this was done years ago from occupational exposure studies, that people who were occupationally exposed to high levels of extremely low frequency fields had higher incidences of Alzheimer's disease. So these are people like electricians that are working in, in, uh, in fields uh, from our power wiring. And they were getting, um, you know, higher amounts of Alzheimer's. Um, so, you know, and, and those, as I mentioned before, they, work on the, they also work by the VGCC activation mechanism. So these are things that are all, um, there, there's evidence from gen genetic polymorphisms uh, data that excessive, that elevated VGCC activity can cause uh, uh, Alzheimer's. And, uh, and there's this fascinating study that was published by Zhang et al. I'm going to finish up quickly here. Um, that showed that young rats exposed to multiple short pulses of microwave EMFs uh, so these are very short pulses, uh, and, um, and then they were looked at later as middle-aged rats, long after these exposures were over, and what do you find? You find they have uh, oxidative stress in the brain, they have high levels of the amyloid beta protein, which is known to be, have a crucial role in causing Alzheimer's disease, and they have cognitive and memory impairment in middle-aged rats. And this is in rats. Rats are not known to suffer from Alzheimer's disease. And here they are. You just expose them and you get lots of Alzheimer's. Okay, so uh, I think I will finish there. Thank you very much. Uh, Kenneth Bruce, um, I found today... Sorry? Who are you addressing? Uh, I think uh, it'll relate to d d Dr. Munro uh, uh, and Professor Paul. The combined effect is just staggering. Uh, I've learned an awful lot today. Um, I've had to learn um, from my own experience that I'm allergic to additives, preservatives and colouring and you face a meal not knowing whether you've got seven and a half hours of, of serious oh, convulsions before you put it right. Uh, but I, I can relate to what Professor Paul said. I had eight parathyroids taken out when I was 21, 21, 22 years of age because my doctor said I'd got excessive calcium, which was showing itself that, that there were days when I could... I had to crawl out to my car on my hands and knees, you know. I, I was treated by the best in the business, Trevor Cook at Birmingham General, who took out eight parathyroids, and he said to me at the time, you've got two choices, have the operation or be dead in six months. So we move on then to 2000, worked brilliantly. I was checked every year, not a problem. The calcium came down, and since 2000, I've had this allergy, and I've had to work out for myself, my doctor will just say, you've got closes. <laughs> I'm not sure how helpful that is. Um, but as I say, I have to be very careful with gravy, uh, any additives or preservatives in it. I think that's the main problem I have. I don't want to break into your... so, well, I, I'm only saying today, been, been very helpful. Uh, only that, you know, if I could find a cure and not been but not be petrified i have been here about 18 months ago to uh, to, di to 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 speak to dr is it schmeck speck um and i i think i would like i'm encouraged today to 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 continue and see if we can if we not find a cure moderate the symptoms because I, I never know when it's going to happen
Anybody else got a question they want to raise? Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Paul, what would be your top three recommendations for a preventative approach to the EMS in the modern world? Uh, for ordinary people, at the, I've got teenagers that are constantly using their mobiles, etc. Is this is this working? Too? Yeah. yeah I, you know, I mean, obviously, avoidance is the first thing you always have to do. The problem with EMFs is they come from so many different sources, mm -hmm. and so I'm not sure. You know, how, and. I, I, we could probably spend about three hours talking about this and, and still not exhaust, you know, everything um, because there are so many different sources of EMFs, but, you, you know, you kind of start one at a time and try to, try to reduce what you can um, with, with each of them. Um, you know, obviously, if, if you have to use a cell phone, there, there are safer ways to do it. Um, you don't carry them on your body. That's one of the things you don't do. Uh, but you also, uh, you know, don't, uh, you, you can use a headset, you can use them on speakerphone, that's better. But, you know, but there are people who are so sensitive, they can't, they can't tolerate anything like that. And, w I mean, the problem is, you know, we've, we've got cell phone towers all over the place. Uh, we have Wi-Fi all over the place. Uh, we have, uh, you know, I mean, and, and we're, we're continuing to produce more and more of these devices of various sorts all the time. There are issues of what's called dirty electricity in our wiring that can be an issue. Um, and, uh, you know, it goes on and on. I mean, the, 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 so, so avoidance is always important, is critical, you know, whether you're sensitive to chemicals or you're sensitive to, to EMFs, but actually doing it in practice is, 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 is a major challenge. Um, you know, yes. I, obviously there are things you can do, but you know, but it, it takes it takes time. But then there are all the other questions of treatment that would improve yeah. things. Perhaps I could answer this too. Um, some many years ago, I was asked to go to a school for deaf children, and at the school, uh, they said that uh, it's absolutely dreadful. Um, since the s summer holidays, uh, the children have gone completely berserk and we can't cope. Now, this is a school where children are already handicapped. And um, it's a huge problem because there wasn't anywhere else for them to go. But they were disturbed and running around and not able to be controlled. And what had happened is there had been two things that had happened over the summer holidays. They'd put urea formaldehyde foam insulation mm -hmm. into the walls of mm -hmm. the school to insulate it, and it was outgassing still, so a lot of formaldehyde exposure. But also they'd introduced a new system for the children where they had headsets, and the frequencies that were being used into the headsets from the teacher who was teaching them is the same frequency as for formaldehyde. And what happened, according to Dr. Cyril Smith, and what happened is that these children were completely um, overwhelmed by chemical and electrical exposure, the imprints of which were similar, and they were totally, it was impossible for them to survive properly. So I said, well, you have to outgas the place have the windows open, have as much heating on to outgas it as possible. But what we did was we changed the diet of the children in the school. They, were, they all wrote down their diets on little um, pink uh, um, exercise books, and some of the diets were appalling. You know, they would come to school with having eaten a bun or something, or sometimes they would have had a sugary something or other, their diets were, were bad. At school, uh, some of them actually lived in, in, in houses with the house parents. And at the school, the children were given a lunchtime meal, but uh, they would have house parents they would go ho home to in the evening. And so what we had to do is we taught the children, we taught the 
house parents, we taught their own parents, we taught the teachers, we had to teach the school psychologist and the school meal service how to cater for these children, and we put them on clean food diets. They had proper food instead of, um, as they depicted, an orange squash bottle. And I made them write on this because they had to be taught not to do this. They were writing on the orange squash bottle all the additives in it, the azo dyes that would have been very disturbing to some. And then they had an orange juice bottle, and I said, what's in that? And they put OJ. So... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the whole point is that they had, we had to do all this teaching of everybody in order to get it right. But by the end of the second term, that was the spring term, the children were fine as they had been before, even though they had still the same headsets and they still had presumably residual uh, urea formaldehyde exposure. But the diet made a huge difference. So you can do it from well, different angles. Just ask, I think maybe behind Kim's question there might have been the thought that is there anything in LDI, low dose immunotherapy, that would help any of these situations? Yes. EMF, if you like. Well, yes, because you're treating the foods and chemicals in the same way. So, that's, so that is the actual modus operandi of this. We... we uh, treat their sensitivities generally and it reduces their heightened sensitivity to electrical fields. So I think what uh, <laughs> Dr. Munro said is there is something for people that suffer from these and you can treat the diet mm -hmm. which has a beneficial effect overall of the ability to cope with the EMS. Is that, is that fair summary? Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. you. Though, though you can't uh, overcome massive exposure, people yeah. sometimes have to move if they're living under a high tension cable or something. Uh, I've, sorry. I think there is one more. <coughs> one connection that uh, that is missing here is that. Can uh, I just you over there, yeah. Peter, Dr. Peter Julio actually works within the Breakspear team, so he obviously is close to what we're talking about. So there's one connection that is missing here. I'm sorry for my voice, but uh, that uh, usually the immune system. That's the reason why we do lymphocyte sensitivity. The immune system, if they are taught to fight, and the signal for them to start fighting is through calcium signaling. And that is the reason why we, we, when we do lymphocyte sensitivity tests, what we are actually doing is that we would have captured a, an enemy soldier and we are trying to interrogate that soldier to find out what their mission to fight is by showing them all these other things like salicylates and uh, nickel and the rest of it to find out which one they would be fighting. Now, the missing connection with the electromagnetic field is that these soldiers who are already taught, they usually lie dormant, but one of the signals to to make them start fighting is electromagnetic uh, I mean, uh, signaling. And that is what we also do during lymphocyte sensitivity tests, that you expose the lymphocyte. If it says nothing, then you introduce the electromagnetic wave as well. Most likely they will talk and tell you what they are fighting. <laughs> See? So, so that, is, that is exactly the reason why some people, they will say, okay, I've become sensitive to elect electromagnetic wave, when actually it means that they were already sensitive to something, but there were very many soldiers who were lying low. They have not yet got, they were sleeping soldiers. So, so they were lying low waiting for that trigger moment to tell them to start fighting. And once the electromagnetic wave triggers them, then the whole immune system is mobilized, and then you start feeling terrible. And then you blame the electromagnetic waves when actually you had already been sensitized to something else before. Like a typical case is Jean's uh, children uh, case. So, it, what it means you have to do. Is the sort of testing available generally, Peter? Can your GP sort it out? No, no. <coughs> Not at all. But you see, the, this lymphocyte sensitivity test started because. Uh, Oh, I mean, the where, where do people go if they want to have themselves or whatever? 
family tree attested. They have to come to Brexpia at the moment because Brexpia is the only one, uh, is the only, uh, I mean, uh, clinical thing that I've actually collaborated with the, with the laboratory. But they still say that it is not for clinical uh, what. Uh, for, 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 it is still research. Up to now, it is only us who are here who have put our foot down and say we will we will string up our own qualification and say it is for treatment. Okay. Well, yeah. except well, except that I can say that when a test is done by a laboratory, the laboratory is a research laboratory, but once there has been a publication, in effect, that validates the test to some extent. So we're just awaiting that position. We are trying to do that now, after mm -hmm. the publication. So you're awaiting yeah, the position uh, there. Yeah, I've got <coughs> two questions. The last question, I think, was uh, answered, the lymphocyte sensitivity test. I, I'm electrosensitive myself. Um, I've worked in electronic engineering and worked with high-power microwaves uh, at university, and that's where I, I think I, I, I got the, the problem. Um, the other two questions I've got are... Uh, one is when I was doing my studies in, in microwaves, they talked about the, the skin depth effect uh, of microwaves. They're very small, one or two millimeter sort of wave, uh, sort of wavelength size. And they were saying that penetration into your body or any, anything is very difficult, doesn't have the energy and the depth to actually penetrate deep. So, so if, if we take that, that that is the case, then is it, that the skin is, is getting sensitive and the calcium effects that you talk about is skin and then it, it, it somehow goes into the deeper organs or, or is that a I, different uh, effect? I don't, I, I, I'm, I've heard these things, obviously I'm skeptical about them. Uh, one, of, one of the interesting studies that was done by a, a group in Switzerland, they were studying, they found that uh, when uh, when pregnant cattle were being grazed near cell phone towers, uh, that many of the calves were born with cataracts. Now they're deeply in, in the body of the mother, and here, here they come out and they have cataracts. I mean, so there's something wrong with this argument. I don't know what it is, but it, it, you know, it, I, empirically it doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't hold up. Uh, thanks. Uh, the, the other question, uh, at practical level, about food, um, is t having too much calcium in your diet, is that an issue? You know, milk, uh, cheese, and all these things, or are they, will they most of that go through your system and it's not really? It, 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 it's a minor issue, not a major issue. I mean, in general, we, we regulate the calcium in the blood in ways that were, have been talked about here. And so, in general, the calcium in the diet doesn't have a large effect. It, it can have a small effect, but um, that's not the main thing we need to worry about. And perhaps I can add to that, which is that uh, if you just have in your mind's eye the, the skeleton, you'll see how much calcium there must be, because it's that which is depicted in, in x-rays. Uh, it's the third commonest mineral in the body, but we don't want it cluttering up cells. We want it in the right place. And so there's thousands of times more outside the cells than inside the cells. I think the, the, the thing is that the level of calcium in the cytoplasm is maintained very low. It's about uh, 10 to the minus 7th molar, 10 to the minus 7th molar. There's, there's, and so there's something like a 10,000-fold concentration gradient, but there's also a big electrical gradient that drives it into the cell. So there's a gigantic force basically driving calcium in the cell, and we keep it out. So that tells you it's important to keep it out under most circumstances. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing all this stuff. So, um, but it's, 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 the, it's the regulation of that flux both in and out, that's, that's critical. Um, I have a, a technical questions for each of you. Um, Dr. Munro, um, there are more and more chemicals being produced and thrown at us all the time. Our world is just becoming more and more polluted. How does your testing take account of that constant rolling out of more and more chemicals? Um, and also, could you tell me how the testing that you do 
differs if it does in any way from cytotoxic testing? Well, the testing that we do for uh, uh, our patients is personal to that patient. We test the individual uh, with a tiny dilution of something to which they might be sensitive and observe their, their reactions. And we also observe what happens uh, to a skin wheel if we do it, introduce it in that way. So we're able to tell what suits the individual. With regard to, to um, the thousands of chemicals, yes, I'm afraid we are a species that is busily polluting itself. Um, the big problem is going to be, as has been said, we're not only going to be facing uh, masses of pollutants from electromagnetic pollutants, but also from chemical pollutants. So it's important to try to clear things away from the body and to minimize the exposure to the chemicals that are noxious. So we're not talking about toxicology, which talks about poisons. Poisons are something which affects a person at the minutest dose and can be very toxic. But we're talking about um, pollutants, which are said to be non-toxic, but which can accumulate in the body. And with we, we can measure um, something like 168 uh, common pollutants in one of the tests that we do, um, and then do a program to clear it out of the body. And we clear it out using the skin, the gut, uh, the breath, and uh, by diverting things from the body into the kidneys. <clears throat> and so we, we use these mechanisms for clearance. <clears throat> Maybe if I can summarize there, some people who are so enthusiastic about cutting down carbon dioxide we're generating might spend their time and their efforts trying to reduce all this pollution through EMF or through chemicals that's going on. Because that, in the longer run, if what Professor Paul is saying, will have effect on the genes, then that in the long term is probably more dangerous to the world population. Mm. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can oh, sorry, I, yeah. sorry, I just had one more question for Professor Paul. Um, can you explain to me, because I'm, I'm trying to just grasp the mechanism that you were describing, um, what actually draws calcium into the cells in the first place? I mean, I get that when the gates are open, they rush in, but what's actually attracting them into the cells? Well, the, the, there, as I, I just said, there, there's this huge electrochemical gradient that drives calcium in. It's gigantic, okay? It's, uh, you know, and so, so uh, you know, it, there's 10,000 times, is just the concentration of calcium outside the cell is about 10,000 times higher than the concentration in the cytoplasm, okay? So there, there, it's, it's not, that's not really difficult. It's not a difficult issue. Yeah, no, I get it's that. It's easy that. to understand. Yep. What, what's, you know, but, but what's true is that calcium is an important regulatory molecule. So what we do is part of our normal physiology is we open these channels for a short time and let some calcium in let it regulate something, and then we chuck it out. The problem with this is it's huge, huge, huge amounts, yeah. way above that. Yeah, just, just to reinforce, because you asked a very important question, <coughs> calcium signaling is actually the life of the cell. And it also differentiates between excitatory cells and non-excitatory cells. So whether the cell is going to produce electrical impulses in order to do some other work or whether that cell is going to be dumb and do nothing. And it is actually the one that keeps us alive because it is the one that dictates when the heart should beat. You see? It is the one that, uh, that actually dictates exactly when the heart should go pop and you, it beats or it ignores other impulses and stay refractory. So calcium signaling is very, very important. And also, once it is released from outside, inside the cell, it is never roaming free. It is like a VIP with the entourages, you know, like a prime minister going somewhere. 
with all these cars and everything. So they are in packages. Tesco bags that have been wrapped around them, they don't go free into the cells. They are VIPs. They only go to do certain things only. And then they're out again. Just like uh, uh, Dr. Cameroon will, I mean, Mr. Cameroon will not come into central London and meet Boris Johnson without the entourages. He will be, he will just come walk quickly and go back to where he's supposed to be safe. That's how you should look at calcium. It's very, very important. Hi. Um, in relation to the neuropsychiatric effects the, uh, of electromagnetic radiation, in relation to teen depression, um, how do you think um, cetraline, or probably Zoloft for you, um, do you think that counters the symptoms um, or masks them? Or what's the relationship there with the calcium channels and... And is there one? I, I don't have the foggiest idea. I think maybe somebody else here might know more about this than I do. Um, but I, I think there's some question about the, 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 the psychoactive drugs and whether they're actually reversing the problems and, or whether they are in some ways masking them. But I, again, somebody else probably, there may be someone else here who knows a lot more about this than I do. With certainly. Uh, well, just, just to say that uh, we've been presented with some evidence that um, uh, some of the psychoactive drugs uh, are just masking things. Um, they, a lot of them increase from tryptophan <coughs> metabolism and if you just use a natural agent like tryptophan, um, that can be degraded and, and uh, eliminated by the body much more safely. Mm. Calcium reuptake, I mean, I mean the specific calcium reuptake um, inhibition passes through calcium because the vesicles of the neurotransmitters that release and the reuptake is controlled Question for Professor Paul. Uh, we didn't get to your concluding slide, unfortunately. Um, in your conclusions, one is to repeal the Telecommunications Act of 1990. Yeah, that, that, so that's an American act. That was an American idiocy, but anyway, yeah. Right. How, how realistic is it that that act could be changed? <laughs> And in light of the U.S. Navy study in 71, would we have to wait another 45 years to get some change? Um, it, it, it is only realistic if there is a major outcry from a vast number of the public. If that does not happen, it will never, it will never be. That will never happen. Um, I don't know whether that's whether there's any realistic prob possibility of that. But my impression is that people are becoming more and more skeptical about the industry claims on this. And I think that's, and let, let me just give you a little story that happened about a day, a day ago to me. When I, was, when I flew into Heathrow Airport and I'm going through the, uh, the immigration uh, talking to the man there, and he asked me, what am I doing here? And I tell him I'm giving a talk here. And he said, what's the talk about? And I said, uh, I'm talking about how electromagnetic fields impact the cells of our bodies. And he looks at me and he says, I bet it's not good. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I said, I said to him, um, that's right, it's not good, but it, industry will tell you just the opposite. And he says to me, of course. So, I mean, I, I really do feel that, that people's views are, are, are starting to change on this. And, and uh, many lay people, I think, are becoming more and more skeptical. So, who knows what's possible? I, I, I can't say, really. Uh, Professor Paul, I'm convinced by your argument on nitric oxides that that is one of the effects I have. What tests can be carried out to prove that, 
In my case. That uh, nitric oxide? Well, you can, I mean, okay, so nitric oxide is unstable in the body. But when uh, what it gets converted into are nitrates and nitrites, which can be measured clinically. So if you're looking for a clinical test to see if you're reacting, for instance, to electromagnetic fields uh, or to chemicals, probably, um, you could measure an increase in nitrates and nitrites. The only question is, what's the optimal time? to do that. That is, how long after exposure would be the optimal time? And I, don't, I haven't seen any data on that. But it should, it should be something that should be, you, you know, it, it's doable based on standard clinical tests. And you can measure BH4. Hmm? BH2, BH4. Yeah, but that, that's a lot harder, right? Yeah. We, yeah. we can do that. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. Bridge Bay can do that test. Not the not the test on nit nitric oxide, and um, but that we can do a test which is one step beyond that, which is to measure um, tetrahydrobiopterin, which is a product which comes from this reaction. Um, you, you can you can say something about that, Marty, because it's your work. I don't I don't think I want to get into it. Well, we. No, is anybody got a word to say? Yeah. Well, I think it just remains for me to thank our speakers. Thank you, Professor Paul. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Munro. Mm -hmm. It's been very interesting. Um, can I just remind you, if you want the details of the uh, petition, then do make sure you put your email address on the sheets at the back there. And then for me to oh, thank two other people. Mm -hmm. Our friends from mm -hmm. Healthy House who you'll see their display at the back there. They are uh, mm. very helpful. And I think I was, we got help from them in terms of sending out notification of this event via their emails. <laughs> and I very wonder if you say how surprised they were. I hope they were pleased as well. I certainly was, because I'm a supporter and a user of Healthy House um, uh, products. And when I got the email, I thought, oh, that's, that's clever. <laughs> mm -hmm. How do they know this is going on? But now I know the answer. Very good, thank you both of you.